Hi everyone, welcome to today's textile talk. This is a virtual talk and tour with Victoria Finley Wolf, now and then playing with purpose with the artist. So this talk is presented by the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts, and we are so happy to have them here today and um, to have Victoria with us today. Um, and you all for joining us. So before we leap into the presentation, I wanted to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way. If you have any technical difficulties with your Zoom during the presentation, please feel free to send us a note in the Q&A box so we can work with you to find a solution. It is always a great option to just exit out of Zoom and then log back in and because we'll still be here and that fixes most of the problems we see with Zoom. I do wanna let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded. So if you can only catch part of it, you can definitely watch the replay or you can tell a friend about it later so that they can watch it too. We also respectfully ask that you be courteous as you engage with the speakers, moderators and the other participation, participants. Um, please use the Q&A box for your questions. Please use the chat box for greeting others and use the survey at the end of the presentation for any commentary or any ways that we can improve this webinar series. We are very excited to make textile talks more accessible with the use of, of live closed captioning. So if you prefer not to view those captions, um, you are able to turn them off in the bottom of your screen. Now, if you guys are new to Textile Talks, we welcome you. Uh, this is a free weekly presentation series um, of presentations and panel discussions, and they are led by the fiber art organizations, including the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Quilt Museum, or San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, Surface Design Association, and the Modern Quilt Guild. The textile talks, as you saw before, are sponsored by Moda Fabric and Supplies, Quilting Daily, eQuilter.com, Aurifil, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spools Seminars, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, TheQuiltShow.com, and Pie Silks. Now that all of the Zoom information and information about textile talks is out of the way, I would love to introduce the senior curator at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. This is Emily Schlemowitz, and she will be your moderator today. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brenna, and thank you to the Modern Quilt Guild and all of the sponsors of Textile Talks. We are delighted to be sharing this incredible exhibit with this audience. Um, as Brenna mentioned, I'm Emily Schlemutz. I'm the senior curator at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts, and I'm very glad to be joined today by artist, textile designer, and author Victoria Finley Wolf. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts, we are located in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, about 30 minutes north of Milwaukee, and are housed in a historic farmstead built in the 1850s. Our main gallery, which you'll be seeing today, is in the former barn that has been retrofitted to serve as a museum. In addition to the barn, we also maintain several original outbuildings on the property. Victoria has long been a friend of the museum. We held her first ever solo museum exhibition in 2014. Our board chair at the time, Susan Warnicke, saw Victoria's beautiful um, double-edged love quilt at the first quilt con in 2013, for which Victoria won best in show and approached her about doing an exhibition at the museum. And as I say, the rest is history. Um, now, seven years later, since uh, her solo show, we are delighted to exhibit the retrospective Victoria Finley Wolf now and then playing with purpose. So Victoria is gonna spend some time for the, last, for the next 35 minutes going through a presentation. And I will be monitoring the Q&A. We'll leave the questions to the end. We're going to do a virtual tour in the gallery so you'll get to see the, the um, quilts in situ. So I'm going to go away and uh, leave it to Victoria. Thank you so much. OK. Hello, everybody. So good to see so many of you here. Let me get to my screen share here and pull this up. All right, here we go. So first of all, thanks for joining us today. I'm super excited and honored to uh, have my second exhibit at the Wisconsin Quilt Museum, as Emily mentioned. Uh, the first time I exhibited 
Uh, a small selection of double wedding ring quilts, actually the first 13 double wedding rings that I had made back in 2000, exhibited in 2014, I believe at the museum. And now seven years later, I have this retrospect exhibit that I'm gonna walk you through today. Um, giving you a little bit of background uh, briefly on me and also looking at a couple of series that I really focused on uh, in this exhibit. I'm gonna try to get through uh, a little bit on each of the quilts fairly quickly. I've got about 35 minutes to get through that. So let's just jump right in and uh, let's see what we got. So when you first come into the museum, you're gonna see a few pieces in the entryway, including um, this very lovely uh, quilt on the right. <laughs> 1983, probably my first quilt, although I'd already been sewing for several years before that. Um, but definitely this was my first quilted item. You'll notice that it looks quite thick and quite puffy and a quite limited palette uh, because of those lovely options that we had in the 80s. It's not the prettiest thing. I have to say that I'm always a little envious when I see uh, other people's first quilts and they're so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Granted the fact that I was a very young teenager at the time when I made this quilt, so I feel it still gets props. I actually used uh, upholstery batting from my dad's upholstery business, which he had on the farm. I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. And uh, the problem with upholstery batting is that it's two inches thick. So it's not rolled out thin like it is in the quilts, the way that we're using batting in our, in our work now. So it's ridiculously thick and it's not very big and it has very few lines of stitching. So I, I like to show it because it's nice to see how far one has come. <laughs> and, um, and the quilt on the second panel on the left is actually a quilt that I made when I was in college. It's uh, called the Tree on Summit. And this is actually uh, me experimenting with playing with acrylic paint. I have a fine arts degree in painting and I was playing with my acrylic fabric or acrylic paint on fabric instead of on canvas to kind of see what sort of effect I was gonna get, how was the paint going to behave. And so I made this quilt and I brought it into, into my class for uh, as a homework assignment. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, the kind of response that I got uh, to making a quilt in an art school and you know what is that what does that actually look like I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. The next pieces you'll see in the gallery are uh, actually in the entryway are the pieces on the left some of you may have seen uh, my quilted coat lecture that I had done last year. I had made a coat out of uh, unfinished quilt that I had actually learned to free motion quilt on and never finished it and wanted to do something interesting with it. And I actually made the top quilt. I knew my phone would ring during this time. It's hard to turn that off. Um, but I also wanted to be able to play with those spaces. And it was a really good distraction away from making quilts. The beauty of the quilt, uh, this quilted coat, is that it's it's a very simple pattern. It can you can use any kind of a quilted pattern, but thinking about how you're filling those front panels, the back panels, and the sleeves, something that's very simple for you to really play up. So I wanted to give that coat, uh, that old quilt, a new look by turning it into a coat, and it was a really fun project to do. As I was working on putting pieces together for this exhibit. I also wanted to uh, have something made for the museum in uh, my gratitude for them hosting uh, my second exhibition at the museum. So I was secretly making a, a photo double wedding ring quilt of the museum. Uh, the museum itself is actually an old farmstead and the barn is what's turned into the galleries. So I have a picture of the, of the museum itself and the inset of my double wedding rings. And I actually use the leftover pieces from the coat because I don't want anything to go to waste. And, it, and surprisingly, the, the two different elements that uh, were not planned, but actually the two color palettes worked perfectly together uh, to be able to come up with uh, a finished sort of a complete thought, a complete sentence. So I've donated both of those pieces to the museum. The piece on the right was actually done for an exhibit. 
Um, you'll start to see in, in several of the new pieces that I'm showing is sort of an ongoing series of, of incorporating digital imagery into uh, traditional um, patchwork. And we're gonna see a little bit more of that as we go along. And I'll talk a little bit more about how I'm doing that. First off, I'd like to give a big shout out uh, to my grandmother, Elda Wolf, who was my biggest inspiration. I wouldn't be doing quilts if it wasn't for the quilt that you see behind the portrait quilt, which is one of hers. Um, these are the quilts that we slept under on the farm. They were all made of double knit polyester, crimpoline, which are thick, um, very thick fabric. And she would lay a sheet down in front and she would sort of arrange these pieces on the sheet and hand stitch them down. And she would continue adding pieces very much like you put a puzzle together and hand stitch until she covered the entire sheet. So to me, this was the only language I had as a small child um, for how to make a quilt because of these are the quilts that we slept under, these sort of mosaic, happy, scrappy quilts of a billion different colors. I do actually think that a lot of these colors of these polyesters are things that have really embedded in my palette, the way that I use color, because these are the things that I was exposed to. So the, the portrait quilt of my grandmother that you see hanging above the quilt and also on the right is uh, a quilt I wanted to do honoring her and doing it in a way in which she made her quilts. So it's, the image is, is printed on fabric. I'm putting those images into Photoshop and I'm manipulating and getting the effects that I want. And then I hand stitched all the fabrics down just the way that she did. And then I hand quilted it. And the binding is just the backing of the, of the quilt turned to the front because that's how my grandmother's quilts were finished. This is a very small quilt, it's not huge, but it took me a very long time to actually finish it because I would only do a couple rows of hand quilting on it at a time. I think mostly because one, I was enjoying it so much, I didn't want the project to end. Um, and, and two, I, it was just really precious to spend more time of, of thinking about my grandmother's process and also thinking about my own process and, and how much she's influenced the things that I do. Not to leave my grandfather out, uh, I felt it was time to do something that included my grandfather. So during quarantine last year, I found this photo of my grandfather on his birthday holding his dog, Herman. And, you know, it was one of those classic 70s little square pictures printed out with the year and everything on the side. And so I was trying to think of how I could do justice to make a good man's quilt, a good grandpa quilt, what would that look like? And one of my fondest memories is time spent in the kitchen with my grandparents. Um, and, and looking at this photo, the yellow linoleum uh, sort of faux tile that you see on the wall behind him, I kind of had a moment of realizing how much um, colors of my childhood have really influenced the colors that I use now. And ultimately, my kitchen is actually painted the same color. And I had not made that mental connection until I started working on this quilt. So that weird goldy mustard color is actually what I have my kitchen painted in. And so I wanted to really play on that color in this quilt, using elements of the design of the quilt, like the tile aspect, and sort of you know, making a warm, cozy, comfortable looking quilt. Um, it just brings me a lot of joy to see that. When I really kind of started focusing on making uh, quilts sort of full time in my life is when my daughter came in to our family. Um, I wanted to make the perfect quilt. And I don't know if any of you out there make perfect quilts. I certainly don't make perfect quilts but I knew she was going to be my only daughter and I wanted her to have the cutest thing. So I made like 10 quilts, didn't really like some of them. So I just cut them up into little pieces. And at the same time is when blogs were really popular. And so I was learning about all these other kinds of quilt blocks that were possible and, and quilting techniques from making flying geese to standard traditional blocks, to applique, to some surface design, to, you know, anything that I could do. Um, 
it was like a kid in a candy store, just sort of learning all these different techniques. I actually started this quilt, the bottom edge of it, you'll see that I actually took a sheet and was trying to do what my grandmother did with polyester, but because I was using cottons, I was having to turn an entire sheet through my sewing machine, trying to use all the fancy stitches to stitch down the raw edges on the cotton so they wouldn't fray. I got so bored with that and the full body workout of having to keep turning this giant sheet through the machine. So I ended up putting that part of the quilt away and I cut up all those blocks and all those um, quilt tops that I'd never finished for my daughter and decided there had to be a faster way. And I started mosaicing and putting them all over very much like an old traditional sampler quilt, throwing it all up on the wall. And I thought that also gives me a look of my grandmother's quilts. And that sort of is what started me um, on the path of thinking, how else can I use scraps and fabric uh, to convey the story that I want to tell? So ultimately, when I got this quilt sewn together, I went back and I added the bit that I started down at the very, very bottom and just to sort of complete the look. I call it my everything but the kitchen sink quilt. It actually has embroidered kitchen towels up at the top. So it sort of it has influenced a style called uh, kitchen sink quilting now. You might have heard that. This is uh, my quilt where that name comes from. Probably the one quilt that I would uh, save if my house was on fire because so much of my life has happened. It's not just the thoughts that I put in when I was making the quilt, but everything that was happening in my life at that time, including my grandmother passing away or my daughter coming into my life, all of that, um, all that life experience that happens in this quilt. So that makes the quilt extra special to me. As I said, I don't make perfect quilts. Don't know if any of you guys do, but this quilt on the right is one that I did um, at a time when I first started following quilt blogs. And I was in a group called the Maverick Quilters and they were all about improv. So this is long before the Modern Quilt Guild. And we were playing um, very much sort of uh, followers of Gwen Marsden and Freddie Moran and um, of gal that I know, Tanya Rakuchi, had a lot of different challenges on her blog for how to make letters and improv pieces and challenges and things. And this is a quilt that I made during that time. So I can still tell you I don't make perfect quilts, but I do them to the best of my ability and I make more because that's how we get better. Coming back to that idea of the scrappy quilts like my grandmother's quilts is sort of then where my 15 minutes of play those of you who are familiar with that book it really kind of took off uh, once my daughter came into my life and we all know as, as a parent how much time that takes up and how much your life changes that I had to figure out very quickly where I was going to get my creative time sort of satisfied and I would give myself 15 minutes each day to actually make something artistic. To me, that was running to my sewing machine and playing sewing scraps together for 15 minutes because that was easier than going to get paint out and way less messy and smelly and toxic. So fabric became a way for me to paint by playing with how I was putting colors together. Okay. This is also the time then when I had started the 15 minutes of play website, which was an interactive website where I was offering challenges and how I was building quilts in an improv way. I do consider all of my quilts improv, even though they have a traditional or sometimes art background to them. Um, I'm, I'm very much rooted in the traditional, but I make all kinds of quilts, whatever floats my boat on any given day. I love it all. So this quilt is, was the third in the series of the first 13 double wedding rings that I made. Uh, the first one I made was the double-edged love that Emily mentioned at the beginning that had won uh, best in show at QuiltCon, the very first QuiltCon. And this was a third in that series. So this quilt is called You Are Here. And as I was working on these quilts, I was really thinking about that experience I had in college when I showed a quilt as one of my homework assignments and it leading to a giant class discussion about whether it was craft or whether it was art and whether it belonged in an art school. And ultimately it was decided that, that it was craft and it did not belong in art school. So I was encouraged not to bring that kind of work to class. So years later, I really spent you know, that, that has kind of stuck with me quite a lot because I, I kind of stopped quilting at that time. And 
all these years later, I am still hanging on to it, thinking about how that is such an in inaccurate statement. Um, the definition of art is something that it's inv invoking an emotion. And you cannot tell me that a quilt does not invoke an emotion. Okay, so quilts to me are art. So what I've been pondering though is um, the things that I was doing in college at that time, besides painting, we were also one of the first years where the Apple um, iMac computers had just come out and were in our college. So we were learning Photoshop, Illustrator, all of this. So I was thinking about for this series, you know, what would have happened to my work had I been exposed to textile design, surface design, and if I kept quilting at that time, what would it look like? So I was thinking about the things that I was doing, which was I have a fine art degree in painting, I have a half a degree in photography, and the computer work that we were doing for you know digital stuff. So I wanted to incorporate all of those elements into one quilt. This quilt is called You Are Here, and it's looking at my life in New York City, how each block is very much like a small town. We can walk around our neighborhood. We know all of our people in our neighborhood. And then you can be swallowed up also in the size and the scale of New York City. So these are photos that I had taken in Times Square, which is basically my backyard of where I lived in New York City. And sort of telling that story about how you can be invisible or have the spotlight on you, depending on where you are, when you are, and what you're doing. And um, that was kind of the start of this series that I call the College Throwback Series. So in a lot of my new work, you're going to see more of this type of work coming into play, mixing the sort of modern aspect of playing with the photography and incorporating that into uh, traditional aspects of quilts or modern designs and, and uh, where that leads to. This was uh, the next quilt in the exhibit is a quilt called A Year of Moments. Uh, this is, my daughter was graduating from high school at this time. So I was really thinking about how much I had changed, how much she had changed, how much our family had changed, thinking about how those wrinkles have evolved, <laughs> all of the emotions that came up with that and, and working with the digital aspect and also still incorporating traditional techniques of piecing and applique and a little bit of paint and sort of, again, mixing all of those different ideas together to tell the story that I wanna tell. So all of those things in this particular quilt that uh, from texture to wrinkles to emotions, all that I see are all of the things that have brought me to this very moment. We're gonna jump a little bit to, um, there are eight quilts. Uh, this is the first quilt that you see when you come into the exhibit at the museum. You can see the big beautiful brown walls of the barn, which is the gallery space. And the longest wall, um, I have these eight quilts that are part of a new series that I'm working on called the Option Expedition Series. I teach a lot and lecture a lot. And one of the things that I find people really get sort of um, paralyzed by is having to make choices, making decisions, and sort of getting, um, getting them through the fear of picking an option and going with it and not worrying about, is it the right one? Do I need to pick something else? Like just focus and pick one and make it to the best of your ability and then jump in and make another one. So this series is actually based on looking at one set of elements and then how many different possibilities can you come up with that? So I have hundreds of these designed, which I've worked on on airplanes from all of my travels constantly. Something for me to do, it's better than playing Candy Crush to me, um, is playing and designing with these elements. It's also a different way that I'm normally used to designing. So it was really fun for me to play with many different photo apps, using these basic elements, the same color palette, and seeing how many different variations I can get and how powerful each one of them can be um, and how far can I push it? And then where else can I go with it? So these first eight, um, this one for scale so that you can actually see, this was the first one I had started to work on in New York City before the COVID when I still had my pixie cut. Now I've got hair, um, but it's kind of fun to see them for scale. They're all quite large. They're all varying in scale from about eh, probably 86 to about 103. 
they're quite, quite large. We can kind of zip through some of these here. The thing that was really interesting for me to do, because I like to use about uh, 70, 80 different fabrics in one quilt. So for me to limit my palette was definitely a challenge. I'm looking at playing with scale. I'm looking at repetition. I'm looking at what colors actually work their way out as I was playing with these pieces and these, and these shapes. So there's going to be more of these quilts. Here's a couple of shots of them running down the length of the barn. Um, this is going to be a series of about 40 pieces. I have another exhibit, which will be just of these quilts at the International Quilt Museum in 2024. What was really fun for me to have these quilts hanging at the museum and where they're hanging is that looking for the connection between the older work and the new work, I always try to think that I'm trying to get outside of my own box to try something new. I always wanna see what else I can do as opposed to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And what was really exciting to me was seeing that even though these are so much more graphic and a little bit different than the other work that I've done, that there still is a very strong connection uh, to the palette, the shapes, the repetition, all of these things are things that you continually see um, through all of the work that's hanging there. So and we're gonna go through a few more of these to kind of see how, what that looks like. This quilt is called Textured Travel and Happiness, the Life Experiences and Responsibilities of Dreams. This is probably the one quilt that I think has magic in it. I worked on this quilt for over a year, could not come up with what I was doing. It was a commission quilt. It was a, in, a, a daughter had commissioned me to make this in memory of her mother. When we were talking on the just phone about discussing whether or not I was the person to make this quilt, she said, why do you do what you do? And I said, well, I do it because the journey the thing that gets me to start the project all the way through the end of the project, that part of the journey that the quilt takes me on is the part that's the most important to me. It's not so much the final project. And she said, well, that's very interesting. She said, because my mother was a dreamer and she always says life is the journey. So because of the journey, the journey that I enjoy and the journey her mother enjoyed, this is the story and why I got to make this quilt. So it's a wide variety of fabrics, including this embroidered silk kimono that went through the middle of it. The challenge was finding fabrics that um, kind of encaptured all of the different things that her mother had done from the clown council that she was in. So I got the little red noses in there. She raised buffalo, she raised llamas, she lived in Japan for a while, she lived in Hong Kong, she had a farmhouse and they had, you know, all these different kinds of fabrics that tell the story of her uh, through the quilt. And, and literally I struggled with this quilt to finish it and I had a completely different idea. And ultimately I took the whole thing off the wall, went to bed and sort of dreamed what this needed to look like uh, right before I opened my eyes and then finally went down and put this quilt together. That does not happen normally. This was just sort of a magical moment and it's definitely a very special quilt to me. This is the quilt uh, space between heartbeats. I'm very much a process quilter about looking at how do I get from A to Z in a design. This is what I absolutely love about quilt making. I love being able to have my hands on things. I like to not have noise in my studio so that I can really have a communication and a conversation with the fiber that I'm working on. This was actually in the Craft in America video uh, while it was still in progress. Um, so the, the playful part is, is incredibly important to me about the have, making the making being very mindful about the choices and where pieces are sitting so that I'm telling you where I want you to look throughout my quilt and the way that I'm placing colors on the wall. The title of it is the space between heartbeats because everything gets so quiet when I'm working on these that sometimes I can hear my heartbeat. Sometimes I'm just playing with palette of color and how to get the most out of it. I think this is sort of a hint, a quilt that I made in 2015 about coming back and working with solids for the graphic punch and the nature of the quilt. I love that um, 
I find that my process is very cyclical. So I can go from only doing black and white to only doing solids to doing simple quilts to then doing really complicated quilts. And then that cycle sort of starts all over again. This is a quilt called Garden Delights. It's, uh, it started out as two different quilts, came in, took some space from working on one idea, the top half of this quilt, came back the next day, I had this other panel of my grandparents on another wall and thought, gosh, those two really need to come together. And then telling the story of my grandparents, all these photos of my grandparents in their garden at different points and places and their garden was huge. So I wanted to be able to have a quilt that really kind of showed the expanse of what they had and what they were the most proud of. And so this was just a really fun, beautiful project to work on, including working on it with Beth Ann Namish, who's a long arm quilter, who's done some phenomenal quilting on this um, to add the whole rest of the story uh, into the quilt. So if you get a chance to see the music and get to the museum to see this, please admire the quilting for sure. One of my other favorite memories is going with my grandfather across the bridge from Wabasha, Minnesota into Wisconsin. So we didn't travel much. So for me to get in a car as a kid and drive across the bridge into Wisconsin was like going to another country. <laughs> it's a very fond memory. So this was really kind of a good challenge for me to kind of see how can I incorporate the photography and the patchwork and have them really kind of marry and blend themselves together. I have mad love for the Mississippi River. It's quite powerful. And I feel like um, I had to be able to do a quilt sort of in capturing those joyful memories of crossing the bridge. This is a very early quilt called Red Crosses. Um, for those who struggle sometimes with thinking they have to make a perfect quilt, which why just make and then make another one. This was a quilt that I had done back in 2009. And at the time I was more interested in the design than I was my piecing skills. So I did not finish this quilt until 2017. And I contemplated for a long time whether or not I needed to go back and make sure all my seams and everything were lined up because at the time I wasn't into pinning or ironing. I just wanted to make and design, <laughs> but decided that I should live with those things because it's also, it's a good way to acknowledge where you've come from and where you are now. So just keep making and keep exploring and see what else what other opportunities are there for you? These are just some other shots of these pieces hanging in the gallery. And I also think it's interesting to be able to look at that along with the, the red dot quilts in the back, because you can really start to see um, color connections, things that I've been using, palettes that I've been using for a very long time, which are all really rather subconscious that those same colors kind of keep coming up. I always encourage my students to make mistakes because mistakes lead you to the best quilts. This was a quilt that when we cut out all the pieces, the rectangles, I actually cut them all out too short. So to bring them back to the size that I needed, I took the white rectangles and added a piece of red to get it back to the size and all the red rectangles, I put a piece of white on the end. So in this design, it was just meant to be sort of a red and white X quilt but that little rickracky bit that you see was not there, not until I made the mistake of cutting them wrong, right? So making mistakes lead, can lead to the best ideas because you can't always in visual, you know, know where something is going to go, but playing with what you have and look for the opportunity of how can I make this work can really take a great quilt and make it a fabulous quilt. To me, I love this quilt. This is one of my favorite quilts. This is my cascade quilt, um, playing on a, on a braid quilt, which is usually done with a rectangle, but I wanted to be able to add a curve to it to see what could happen. This is a great template just for being able to play with color and look at the shapes that it creates and the connections um, and just spending a lot of time um, playing with value of color. Most of my quilts are now quilted by Shelly Polyi. It's great to have a best friend who is a long armor we kind of came up together. She got her long arm about the time that I decided to quilt full time. So this has just been a real joy because she's quilted most of the quilts in the exhibit. There's probably seven of them that I quilted and then about four quilted by other people. This quilt is called Is That You on the right. Uh, 
has a kind of a long story to it, but briefly is we own a photograph that hangs in our apartment is of a giant photo of a woman who we do not know. And people used to come into our house and say, gosh, is that you? And I was like, no, it's not me, but it's very, she's very serious and she's very sort of in your face. And I thought, I wonder if there, if I can make a quilt that would have that same sort of power um, with a visual of a person in the background. So what I love is how you kind of see the double wedding ring and then you see the background you're peering through and it's a little bit eerie and you're not really sure who it is. And it was just a really fun challenge. And she's a little bit haunting. I kind of love that. Definitely kind of interesting and fun uh, concept. And it was a real challenge to sort of cut out each of those pieces from a photograph and incorporate them all. And none of that is applicated, it's all pieced uh, into the quilt. This is my nightlight quilt, uh, all partial seams. So I had to set up a sewing station next to my design wall. I designed it all on the design wall, had my machine parked right next to the design wall so I could take one piece off the wall and partially sew that seam on, add, grab another piece, partially sew that on till I have this giant quilt where I'm still just adding one tiny piece to the quilt top as I went along. It was definitely a, a challenge for construction, but something just really fun for me to play with. And um, it's called nightlight because I was thinking about, you know, as it was driving and the sun starts peering out from behind the clouds and how the light really kind of sprinkles and scatters. So it was a really fun challenge to both to construct and to play out how the light is twinkling uh, among all of those different colors. This is a quilt from uh, Modern Quilt Magic. It's a color study H1. Sometimes I'm looking at color to kind of make you feel uncomfortable. It's not necessarily the prettiest palette, but what I find really interesting is looking for the vibrations of color, how things relate to each other or not to kind of provoke a different feeling. For me, then making this star storm explosion quilt, which is four of my star storm mini quilts sewn together is also looking for the secondary pattern. And as I was putting this together, this quilt is actually quilted by Tia Curtis. Um, when I was putting the slideshow together, I realized that even though these quilts are done a couple years apart, that the color palettes of these two are very, very similar. But again, look at how different one feels slightly more aggressive and one feels slightly more comforting by the slightly lighter values of the colors, but they're still definitely the same color palettes going on. So even without being conscious, uh, we tend to pick the same kind of colors over and over and over again. This is my Imprimus quilt. This is also um, a new series that I'm working on. This is the second quilt in the series, but Imprimus means of first. So this was the first one I designed, but the second one that I made, the first one of this is called The Language of Trees, which is hanging at the National Quilt Museum right now. Um, something I'm still exploring and playing with, again, repetition of pattern and looking for pattern within the pattern and also playing with color value and, and the glowiness. You can see it on the right where it's hanging way down at the end from one end of the barn to the other for scale of how long the museum is and, and how it kind of holds up from far away like that. And this is my ignition quilt. This is a quilt that went up on my wall and down from my wall about four or five times. Every time when I thought I was finished, I would take it back down, take it apart, change something else, put it back up, you know, trying to tell a story, had a thought in mind, and then one thing would keep changing. And every time I thought it was finished, I would do something else. I'd come back, I added the the image, and then I was thinking about how it looks like the ignition of ideas, and then I had to add the thought bubbles, and then I had to take it apart and add some more white because I wanted it to feel more explosive. And so, you know, I, I'm just because I have one idea, it doesn't mean that's where my idea stops. I can go back and I can continue to revisit uh, some of my ideas and keep adding to them. So I never find a quilt completely finished until who knows when, even after it's binding, sometimes I don't, I might want to go back and add something else to it. Um, this quilt is quite large. It's 105 by 105. Um, and like I said, on the, on the image there, it says storytelling is an important part of my process, whether it stays the same, doesn't matter if it changes everything that I'm stitching in daily is becomes part of the story. The idea can change. 
It may start in one place and might end up somewhere else. To me, that's all part of that process that gets me from A to Z in the design. And the thing that really floats my boat <laughs> when I'm making a quilt, it's the thing that makes me want to start the next project. So when I'm finishing that quilt and putting those last few stitches on it, I'm so ready to uh, jump in and start the next idea. And I think that was our last one for that. Yes, there we go. I think Emily's going to take us through a video uh, tour of the museum next. Yeah, actually, so we're going to bring up the gallery now. So we can see these beautiful works in situ. Uh, hmm. Let's see. So my colleague Devin is in the gallery, so hopefully her video will start working. There we go. Um, so as Victoria mentioned, we this is our title wall. This is what you see when you first walk in uh, to the to the gallery space, um, and. What's really wonderful about Victoria's quilts are the, are the is the stitching. You, so we're going to be able to get a little bit closer um, to some of these. Um, particularly, maybe we'll start with Garden Delights. Um, so yeah, when you walk in, this is to the right. Um, and if you have any questions throughout, just put them in the Q and A. I'm going to Victoria and I will kind of take turns answering things as we can. Um, so yeah. You can see. Yeah, this is where you can really see some of the fabulous stitching on this that Beth Ann did. Um, we had so many discussions about my ideas behind this quilt and how she could incorporate all of that into the quilt. Uh, each of uh, each of myself and my grandparents are sort of represented in this quilt as birds, from wrens to starlings, sort of flying through the air, and robins. There's one of the birds. How sweet that is. Um, Beth Ann does some really beautiful, beautiful work, and and I'm just so tickled that she was able to sort of complete the story on this quilt. And then we did have a question: um, Do you typically quilt your own quilts now, or do you do you do you work with Shelley mostly? I mostly work with Shelley. My small quilts are um, I will usually hand quilt. So it, it depends on the project. I just, I don't have enough time in the day to get everything long-armed. <laughs> I don't have long arms anymore. I had two of them. I got rid of both of my long arms. So I pretty much do everything with Shelly or somebody else if I feel they need to add their story like Beth Ann did to this quilt, which she did just beautifully. Yeah, it's wonderful. And do you find, do you have to, how collaborative is it with Shelly? Do you have to tell, give her a lot of instructions or do you? Um, it depends on the quilt. Um, sometimes we have week long conversations about things and sometimes we just keep it really simple. Depends on the story, depends on what I need to add uh, to finish the sort of the, the thought, you know. This was when I quilted a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, this is wonderful. You can see the, the repetition of the palette um, that Victoria was referencing. The graphic punch to this quilt is, is just lovely for scale. Um, and then another uh, person was wondering, they saw your show in Liberty of, of Lon uh, in London a few years ago, and it was I beyond saw. wonderful. Quotes that I any... sold, yeah, they were quotes for sale, yeah. Do you have any plans to come back to the UK? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to start traveling again, I'm just not on the books right now, but those were quilts that were um, sold to, the, to Liberties, and they were sold in the store. Not so much as an exhibition, it was, they were theirs for sale. Um, someone was wondering what the, what's, what are the words above the smiley face? <laughs> uh, it was a, she was at a parade. That was her plastic bag, the thank you bag, you know, that you get at a grocery store to put her candy in. <laughs> My grandma had a real sweet tooth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then what photo app did you use, do you typically use? I use many different photo apps, whatever I have handy at that particular time. 
from Photoshop to photos that you know, like photo app that comes with your phone to photo grid to anything that whatever I have in there, I've got so many different photo apps to play with. A lot of the viewers are really drawn to your stories about your family. Um, there were a lot of comments about how, how that was just really moving to them. Yeah, pretty much everything I do is connected to the happy memories of spending time with my grandparents. You know, they lived in town. We lived on a farm in the middle of nowhere. So it was just such a joy to be there, um, both for being able to ride your bikes on a tar road as opposed to the gravel road where we lived, <laughs> you know, <laughs> running through the alley and, and going to get candy at the convenience store or the root beer at the root beer stand, you know, that kind of stuff. It was just such a different environment from where I grew up that, uh, and they were very, um, both very creative people in their own way, even though if it was gardening or canning or cooking or making quilts or embroidery or crochet or, you know, all these things that she did. So it was always very, a very inspiring place for me, including the river, the power of the Mississippi is always inspiring. Um, and then to transfer the photo onto the quilt, do you use a certain software? Uh, do you go through Spoonflower or something? Uh, mm -hmm. Many of them are done through Spoonflower. Some of them I've printed. Some of them have painting over the top of them. A little bit of all different kinds of techniques. Like I said, I'm always trying to find something I haven't done before to keep it interesting. I don't want to keep doing the same kind of thing. Every time I'm making a new quilt, I'm trying to make something that maybe doesn't look like I made it. Even though I think that when then when you see all of these together, you're like, oh yeah, you made those. But that's not my goal when I'm making them. So the the fun part of having these up all vertical is being able to make those connections and go, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about how that relates to that, or you know, that kind of a of a surprise. Um, so it, it's always cool when I can make a connection to go, that's why I do that, or. I'm still doing the same thing, even though it looks so different, but I, I'm conscious to try to make a decision about doing something that I haven't done before, um, just to push myself every single time. And I also, when I start a quilt, I always try to start from the frame of mind of being a beginner, um, because then I have everything open to me as, a, as an opportunity to play with, uh, mm -hmm. using that sort of open-mindedness to go, you know, take what I know, but expand on whatever it is I'm doing. I think this uh, part of what I love is having as many tools in my toolbox to play with all at the same time, right? Have you ever considered collaborating with another artist or have you collaborated with another artist? Well, I consider every quilt I make as a collaboration if someone else is quilting it. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of, all my quilts with Shelly are pretty much collaborative pieces. You know, oftentimes when I'm making it, we're talking about what the quilting is going to be. That's why there are a few people outside of Shelly who've quilted some of my quilts because sometimes I'm looking for their uh, thought process to finish the story on top mm -hmm. of the quilt. Um, you mentioned that you live in an apartment. Where do you, where do you quilt and how do you store your quilts? Um, I live in New York City, but I also live on Long Island. We moved out to Long Island before COVID. Um, when I lived in the city, I had uh, rented a, a whole studio space and my store was there. Both of those spaces closed from COVID. And since we moved out to my house, now I have a very tiny studio and a lot of it's all in storage. <laughs> So everything's out of my house right now and very limited to uh, how many pieces I can work on at once. Have you ever taught a class on photographs and digital images and quilts? Um, no, I have not. And I will not be teaching that class. There's, I don't want to have to teach people how to do tech computer tech stuff. That's not my cup of tea. So, <laughs> these are pieces I'm doing for my own series, you know, for my art, you know, studio work. And uh, yeah, I won't be doing a process on those. Yeah. So, I'm currently working on the next 12 quilts in this series of the red dots or the option 
expedition uh, series. So I'm getting, getting a jump on those because I got about 14 more of those to make right now. And do you, are they all going to be at that same scale or are you going to make some different? No, nope, it's going to change mm -hmm. uh, to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> These got done because you asked. <laughs> so all of all eight of these quilts were made uh, since January of, of uh, this year. <laughs> You've kept me busy. I think we froze. Uh -oh. huh? Yeah. There, there we go. go. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I love the graphic nature of these. They're just so wonderful. And the quilting kind of emphasizes that graphic nature with the grid. Um, right. So Shelly and I had many conversations about keeping uh, the quilting the same on all of the pieces. So the quilting that happens in the red will always be the same quilting on all of the future pieces. You know, just sort of uh, keeping the texture of them will be the same, but um, how I'm pushing and scaling, chopping these basic elements and how they can evolve into something else um, is actually making the hair stand up on my arms these days because I can't wait to jump in and get the rest of these quilts made. Um, and can you speak a little bit about the mechanics of producing such a such large circles? Um, yeah, those are all full circle pieced. Uh, when I'm designing these patterns, we uh, are making paper templates of all of these things. So for those of you who say you can't don't want to make your quilts out of paper templates. All of my quilts come are made from paper templates. And uh, these quilts, because I've made so many of those here at my house in a very limited space, I am down on my floor with the scissors and a marking pen and cutting things out in good old fashioned way. And uh, then taking them downstairs to my tiny studio and getting them sewn up. So the scale of working on them in a small space is, is kind of funny in it's. <laughs> In itself. <laughs> oh, it's definitely a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can tell by a lot of my quilts that that red is definitely in, uh, ingrained in me. On the farm, uh, we had international harvester tractors, and my dad was definitely a motorhead. So the tractors were always in good shape and the cars were always in good shape. And the front door of our house was painted International Harvester Red since he had the paint, why not? So like the red itself is sort of uh, ingrained in me. And I've actually made an International Harvester quilt because you know you can only take the girl off the farm so far. <laughs> the red is definitely from my childhood. Um, the aqua that you see a lot uh, was a color that our basement was painted and the gold color was the carpet in our house. So I find that, um, and my bedroom was sort of a light pink. So I find that those colors are colors that continually come back in my work, whether I'm conscious of it or not. Uh, and I think it's proof that when you look at the new graphic quilts and then at all the older work is how much those colors continually come through in all of the work really by accident. It's not a conscious thing, mm -hmm. but definitely colors that I'm really drawn to or just really saturated colors because of those double knit polyesters, those colors that just don't change. You know, that they'll always be so luscious and deep. So you make your own fabric, but do you have a place, do you have, where do you source your fabric or is it from all over? Do you mean the fabric that I collect or the fabric I design for or? Um, the fabric that you integrate into your quilts. Do you have a particular spot that you like to go to or? Um... Well, I've been collecting fabrics just like everybody else for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and plus being a fabric designer, mostly I'm making quilts now out of my own fabrics um, for the past eight years. Um, often, you know, I carry a whole line of solids. So oftentimes most of these are all done with, I should have actually been keeping track of how many bolts of 
uh, red I've been using for on all those <laughs> those new quilts. Yeah, that must be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely going through bolts and bolts of fabric for those. Um, and I didn't used to use a lot of solids because I really like my prints as well. But again, I find that my stuff is very cyclical on how I'm using the kind of prints or solids that I do. And uh, at the moment, we're definitely in a nice, bold, solid uh, portion of my process. This quilt's really interesting to me. This one, what did you do the quilting on this one or did? No, oh, Shelly did. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm always obsessed, obsessed with br bridges in general, that sort of uh, connection of line and pattern, right? And then also connecting the uh, texture through the design of the quilting and the piecing. There's improv piecing, there's traditional piecing, there's some embroidery that goes across the top of the water. I mean, anyone who has a quilty brain looks at a bridge and go, oh, I see a quilt in there. <laughs> so, I have more pictures of bridges, but this one in particular is a pretty special bridge going across the Mississippi. Um, so we're actually, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, so this is, maybe we'll just do a couple more pans. Um, Any last questions? Let's see. So what will happen to these quilts after the exhibition? Um, you know, you mentioned the International Quilt Museum. Is there any other destinations we should know about? I'm still working on things. Mm -hmm. They may pop up somewhere again. Um, some of these were exhibited in my other retrospect at the National Quilt Museum a couple years ago. So I don't know, we'll see. I'm excited to see the uh, Imprimis iteration, that series. Um, yes. are you, that I, I have a third quilt in that series that I'm working on. I just have a, a ton of quilts on my plate right now. So I'm kind of juggling between, I try to do a little bit each day on several different projects. It's the only way I can get, people think I get so much done, but mostly it's because I'm chipping away on many different projects every day. And then all of a sudden I get a whole bunch done. Yes, this one was quilted by uh, Tia Curtis. It's fun to see the backs sometimes, all the different patterns. Okay, well, thank you um, all. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, and once again, we'd like to thank the following Textile Talk sponsors and also just extend a really warm thank you to the Modern Quilt Guild for hosting us this afternoon. Um, and so the sponsors for, we wanna thank the sponsors for helping us keep this webinar series free and open to all who are interested. Again, those are thank uh, Moda Fabrics and Supplies, Quilting Daily, eQuilter.com, Orofil, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spools Seminars, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, TheQuiltShow.com, Ta and Tie Silks. Um, again, I would also just like to say thank you to Victoria for spending us and Thank you, everybody.